20th century alone. You mean guilt by association. It is not a question of guilt, but as long as you are run by the egoic mind, you are part of the collective insanity. Perhaps you haven't looked very deeply into the human condition in its state of dominance by the egoic mind. Open your eyes and see the fear, the despair, the greed, and the violence that are all pervasive. See the heinous cruelty and suffering on an unimaginable scale that humans have inflicted and continue to inflict on each other, as well as on other life forms on the planet. You don't need to condemn. Just observe. That is sin. That is insanity. That is unconsciousness. Above all, don't forget to observe your own mind. Seek out the root of the insanity there. Finding your invisible and indestructible reality. You said that identification with our physical form is part of the illusion. So how can the body, the physical form, bring you to a realization? The body that you can see and touch cannot take you into being. But that visible and tangible body is only an outer shell, or rather a limited and distorted perception of a deeper reality. In your natural state of connectedness with being, this deeper reality can be felt every moment as the invisible inner body the animating presence within you. So to inhabit the body is to feel the body from within, to feel the life inside the body, and thereby come to know that you are beyond the outer form. But that is only the beginning of an inward journey that will take you ever more deeply into a realm of great stillness and peace, yet also of great power and vibrant life. At first, you may only get fleeting glimpses of it. But through them you will begin to realize that you are not just a meaningless fragment in an alien universe. Briefly suspended between birth and death, allowed a few short-lived pleasures, followed by pain and ultimate annihilation. Underneath your outer form, you are connected with something so vast, so immeasurable and sacred, that it cannot be conceived or spoken of, yet I am speaking of it now. I am speaking of it not to give you something to believe in but to show you how you can know it for yourself. You are cut off from being as long as your mind takes up all your attention. When this happens, and it happens continuously for most people you are not in your body, the mind absorbs all your consciousness and transforms it into mind stuff. You cannot stop thinking. Compulsive thinking has become a collective disease. Your whole sense of who you are is then derived from mind activity. Your identity, as it is no longer rooted in being, becomes a vulnerable and ever-needy mental construct, which creates fear as the predominant underlying emotion. The one thing that truly matters is then missing from your life. Awareness of your deeper self, your invisible and indestructible reality. To become conscious of being, you need to reclaim consciousness from the mind. This is one of the most essential tasks on your spiritual journey. It will free vast amounts of consciousness that previously had been trapped in useless and compulsive thinking. A very effective way of doing this is simply to take the focus of your attention away from thinking and direct it into the body, where being can be felt in the first instance, as the invisible energy field that gives life to what you perceive as the physical body. Connecting with the inner body, please try it now. You may find it helpful to close your eyes for this practice. Later on, when being in the body has become natural and easy, this will no longer be necessary. Direct your attention into the body. Feel it from within. Is it alive? Is there life in your hands, arms, legs, and feet in your abdomen, your chest? Can you feel the subtle energy field that pervades the entire body and gives vibrant life to every organ and every cell? Can you feel it simultaneously in all parts of the body as a single field of energy? Keep focusing on the feeling of your inner body for a few moments. Do not start to think about it. Feed it. The more attention you give it, the clearer and stronger this feeling will become. It will feel as if every cell is becoming more alive, and if you have a strong visual sense. You may get an image of your body becoming luminous. Although such an image can help you temporarily, pay more attention to the feeling than to any image that may arise. An image, no matter how beautiful or powerful, is already defined in form. So there is less scope for penetrating more deeply. The feeling of your inner body is formless, limitless, and unfathomable. You can always go into it more deeply. If you cannot feel very much at this stage, pay attention to whatever you can feel. Perhaps there is just a slight tingling in your hands or feet. That's good enough for the moment. Just focus on the feeling. Your body is coming alive. Later, we will practice some more. Please open your eyes now.
but keep some attention in the inner energy field of the body, even as you look around the room. The inner body lies at the threshold between your form identity and your essence identity, your true nature. Never lose touch with it. Transformation through the body. Why have most religions condemned or denied the body? It seems that spiritual seekers have always regarded the body as a hindrance or even as sinful. Why have so few seekers become finders? A long time after their fall from a state of grace and oneness into illusion, humans suddenly woke up in what seemed to be an animal body, and they found this very disturbing. Don't fool yourself. You are no more than an animal. This seemed to be the truth that was staring them in the face. But it was too disturbing a truth to tolerate. Adam and Eve saw that they were naked and they became afraid. Unconscious denial of their animal nature set in very quickly. The threat that they might be taken over by powerful instinctual drives and revert back to complete unconsciousness was indeed a very real one. Shame and taboos appeared around certain parts of the body and bodily functions, especially sexuality. The light of their consciousness was not yet strong enough to make friends with their animal nature, to allow it to be and even enjoy that aspect of themselves let alone, to go deeply into it to find the divine hidden within it, the reality within the illusion. So they did what they had to do. They began to disassociate from their body. They now saw themselves as having a body, rather than just being it. When religions arose, this disassociation became even more pronounced as the you are not your body belief. Countess people in East and West throughout the ages have tried to find God, salvation, or enlightenment through denial of the body. This took the form of denial of sense pleasures and of sexuality in particular, fasting, and other ascetic practices. They even inflicted pain on the body in an attempt to weaken or punish it, because they regarded it as sinful. In Christianity, this used to be called mortification of the flesh. Others tried to escape from the body by entering trance states or seeking out of the body experiences. Many still do. Even the Buddha is said to have practiced body denial through fasting and extreme forms of asceticism for six years, but he did not attain enlightenment until after he had given up this practice. The fact is that no one has ever become enlightened through denying or fighting the body or through an out-of-the-body experience. Although such an experience can be fascinating and can give you a glimpse of the state of liberation from the material form, in the end you will always have to return to the body where the essential work of transformation takes place. Transformation is through the body, not away from it. This is why no true master has ever advocated fighting or leaving the body, although their mind-based followers often have. Of the ancient teachings concerning the body, only certain fragments survive, such as Jesus's statement that your whole body will be filled with light, or they survive as myths such as the belief that Jesus never relinquished his body, but remained one with it, and ascended into heaven with it. Almost no one to this day has understood those fragments or the hidden meaning of certain myths, and the you are not your body belief has prevailed universally, leading to body denial, and attempts to escape from the body. Countless seekers have thus been prevented from attaining spiritual realization for themselves and becoming finders. Is it possible to recover the lost teachings on the significance of the body, or to reconstruct them from the existing fragments? There is no need for that. All spiritual teachings originate from the same source. In that sense, there isn't always has been only one master, who manifests in many different forms. I am that master, and so are you. Once you are able to access the source within, and the way to it is through the inner body, although all spiritual teachings originate from the same source, once they become verbalized and written down, they are obviously no more than collections of words, and a word is nothing but a signpost, as we talked about earlier. All such teachings are signposts pointing the way back to the source. I have already spoken of the truth that is hidden within your body, but I will summarize for you again the lost teachings of the masters so here is another signpost. Please endeavor to feel your inner body as you read or listen. Sermon on the body. It is a misperception of your essential reality that is beyond birth and death, and is due to the limitations of your mind, which, having lost touch with being, creates the body as evidence of its illusory belief in separation, and to justify its state of fear. But do not turn away from the body, for within that symbol of impermanence, 
limitation, and death that you perceive as the illusory creation of your mind is concealed the splendor of your essential and immortal reality. Do not turn your attention elsewhere in your search for the truth, for it is nowhere else to be found, but within your body. Do not fight against the body, for in doing so you are fighting against your own reality. You are your body. The body that you can see and touch is only a thin illusory veil. Underneath it lies the invisible inner body, the doorway into being, into life unmanifested. Through the inner body, you are inseparably connected to this unmanifested, one life birthless, deathless, eternally present. Through the inner body, you are forever one with God, have deep roots within. The key is to be in a state of permanent connectedness with your inner body to feel it at all times. This will rapidly deepen and transform your life. The more consciousness you direct into the inner body, the higher its vibrational frequency becomes. Much like a light that grows brighter as you turn up the dimmer switch, and so increase the flow of electricity. If you keep your attention in the body as much as possible, you will be anchored in the now. You won't lose yourself in the external world and you won't lose yourself in your mind. Thoughts and emotions, fears and desires, may still be there to some extent, but they won't take you over. Please examine where your attention is at this moment. You are listening to me, or you are reading these words in a book. That is the focus of your attention. You are also peripherally aware of your surroundings, other people, and so on. Furthermore, there may be some mind activity around what you are hearing or reading, some mental commentary. Yet there is no need for any of this to absorb all your attention. See if you can be in touch with your inner body at the same time. Keep some of your attention within. Don't let it all flow out. Feel your whole body from within as a single field of energy. It is almost as if you were listening or reading with your whole body. Let this be your practice in the days and weeks to come. Do not give all your attention away to the mind and the external world. By all means focus on what you are doing but feel the inner body at the same time whenever possible. Stay rooted within, then observe how this changes your state of consciousness and the quality of what you are doing. Whenever you are waiting, wherever it may be, use that time to feel the inner body. In this way, traffic jams and lineups become very enjoyable. Instead of mentally projecting yourself away from the now, go more deeply into the now by going more deeply into the body. The art of inner body awareness will develop into a completely new way of living, a state of permanent connectedness with being, and will add a depth to your life that you have never known before. It is easy to stay present as the observer of your mind when you are deeply rooted within your body. No matter what happens on the outside, nothing can shake you anymore. Unless you stay present and inhabiting your body is always an essential aspect of it you will continue to be run by your mind. The script in your head that you learned a long time ago, the conditioning of your mind, will dictate your thinking and your behavior. You may be free of it for brief intervals, but rarely for long. This is especially true when something goes wrong, or there is some loss or upset. Your conditioned reaction will then be involuntary, automatic, and predictable, fueled by the one basic emotion that underlies the mind identified state of consciousness, fear. So when such challenges come, as they always do, make it a habit to go within at once and focus as much as you can on the inner energy field of your body. This need not take long, just a few seconds, but you need to do it the moment that the challenge presents itself. Any delay will allow a conditioned mental emotional reaction to arise and take you over. When you focus within and feel the inner body, you immediately become still and present as you are withdrawing consciousness from the mind. Ira response is required in that situation. It will come up from this deeper level. Just as the sun is infinitely brighter than a candle flame, there is infinitely more intelligence in being than in your mind. As long as you are in conscious contact with your inner body, you are like a tree that is deeply rooted in the earth or a building with a deep and solid foundation. The latter analogy is used by Jesus in the generally misunderstood parable of the two men who build a house. One man builds it on the sand, without a foundation, and when the storms and floods come, the house is swept away. The other man digs deep until he reaches the rock, then builds his house, which is not swept away by the floods. Before you enter the body, forgive. I felt very uncomfortable when I tried to put my attention on the inner body. 
there was a feeling of agitation and some nausea, so I haven't been able to experience what you are talking about. What you felt was a lingering emotion that you were probably unaware of, until you started putting some attention into the body, unless you first give it some attention. The emotion will prevent you from gaining access to the inner body, which lies at a deeper level underneath it. Attention does not mean that you start thinking about it. It means to just observe the emotion, to feel it fully, and so to acknowledge and accept it as it is. Some emotions are easily identified. Anger, fear, grief, and so on. Others may be much harder to label. They may just be vague feelings of unease, heaviness, or constriction. Halfway between an emotion and a physical sensation. In any case, what matters is not whether you can attach a mental label to it but whether you can bring the feeling of it into awareness as much as possible. Attention is the key to transformation and full attention also implies acceptance. Attention is like a beam of light the focused power of your consciousness that transmutes everything into itself. When you are not in your body, however, an emotion can survive inside you for days or weeks, or join with other emotions of a similar dot frequency, that of merged and the pain body a parasite that can live inside you for years, feed on your energy, lead to physical illness, and make your life miserable. See Chapter 2. Forgiveness is to relinquish your grievance and so to let go of grief. It happens naturally once you realize that your grievance serves no purpose except to strengthen a false sense of self. Forgiveness is to offer no resistance to life to allow life to live through you. The alternatives are pain and suffering, a greatly restricted flow of life energy, and in many cases physical disease. The moment you truly forgive, you have reclaimed your power from the mind. Non-forgiveness is the very nature of the mind, just as the mind made false self, the ego, cannot survive without strife and conflict. The mind cannot forgive, only you can. You become present, you enter your body, you feel the vibrant peace and stillness that emanate from being. That is why Jesus said, Before you enter the temple, forgive. Your link with the unmanifested. What is the relationship between presence and the inner body? Is the unmanifested the same as being? Yes. The word unmanifested attempts, by way of negation, to express that which cannot be spoken, thought or imagined. It points to what it is by saying what it is not. Being, on the other hand, is a positive term. Please don't get attached to either of these words or start believing in them. They are no more than signposts. You said that presence is consciousness that has been reclaimed from the mind. Who does the reclaiming? You do. But since in your essence you are consciousness, we might as well say that it is an awakening of consciousness from the dream of form. This does not mean that your own form will instantly vanish in an explosion of light. You can continue in your present form yet be aware of the formless and deathless deep within you. I must admit that this is way beyond my comprehension, and yet on some deeper level, I seem to know what you are talking about. It's more like a feeling than anything else? Am I deceiving myself? No, you are not. Feeling will get you closer to the truth of who you are than thinking. I cannot tell you anything that deep within you don't already know. When you have reached a certain stage of interconnectedness, you recognize the truth when you hear it. If you haven't reached that stage yet, the practice of body awareness will bring about the deepening that is necessary, slowing down the aging process. In the meantime, awareness of the inner body has other benefits in the physical realm. One of them is a significant slowing down of the aging of the physical body. Whereas the outer body normally appears to grow old and wither fairly quickly, the inner body does not change with time, except that you may feel it more deeply and become it more fully. If you are 20 years old now, the energy field of your inner body will feel just the same when you are 80. It will be just as vibrantly alive. The accumulation of time as the psychological burden of past and future greatly impairs the cell's capacity for self-renewal. So if you inhabit the inner body, the outer body will grow old at a much slower rate. And even when it does, your timeless essence will shine through the outer form and you will not give the appearance of an old person. Try it out and you will be the evidence. Strengthening the immune system. Most illnesses creep in when you are not present in the body. If the master is not present in the house, all kinds of shady characters will take up residence there. When you inhabit your body, it will be hard for unwanted guests to enter. It is not only your physical immune system that becomes strengthened, 
your psychic immune system is greatly enhanced as well. The latter protects you from the negative mental emotional force fields of others, which are highly contagious. It doesn't enter your field of consciousness anymore. Or if it does, you don't need to offer any resistance to it because it passes right through you. Please don't just accept or reject what I am saying. Put it to the test. It will also counteract any disruption of your energy field by some form of negativity. However, it is not a substitute for the moment-to-moment -moment practice of being in the body. Otherwise, its effect will only be temporary. Here it is. When you are unoccupied for a few minutes, and especially last thing at night before falling asleep and first thing in the morning before getting up. Flood your body with consciousness. Close your eyes. Lie flat on your back. Choose different parts of your body to focus your attention on briefly at first. Hands, feet, arms, legs, abdomen, chest, head, and so on. Feel the life energy inside those parts as intensely as you can. Stay with each part for 15 seconds or so. Then let your attention run through the body like a wave a few times, from feet to head and back again. This need only take a minute or so. After that, feel the inner body in its totality, as a single field of energy. Hold that feeling for a few minutes. Be intensely present during that time present in every cell of your body. Don't be concerned if the mind occasionally succeeds in drawing your attention out of the body, and you lose yourself in some thought. As soon as you notice that this has happened, just return your attention to the inner body. Let the breath take you into the body. At times, when my mind has been very active, it has acquired such momentum that I find it impossible to take my attention away from it and feel the inner body. This happens particularly when I get into a worry or anxiety pattern. Do you have any suggestions? Breathe into the body and feel your abdomen expanding and contracting slightly with each inhalation and exhalation. If you find it easy to visualize, close your eyes and see yourself surrounded by light or immersed in a luminous substance, a sea of consciousness. Then breathe in that light. Feel that luminous substance filling up your body and making it luminous also. If you need to use your mind for a specific purpose, Use it in conjunction with your inner body. Only if you are able to be conscious without thought can you use your mind creatively. And the easiest way to enter that state is through your body. Whenever an answer, a solution, or a creative idea is needed, stop thinking for a moment by focusing attention on your inner energy field. Become aware of the stillness. When you resume thinking, it will be fresh and creative. In any thought activity, Make it a habit to go back and forth every few minutes or so between thinking and an inner kind of listening, an inner stillness. We could say, don't just think with your head, think with your whole body. The art of listening. When listening to another person, don't just listen with your mind, listen with your whole body. Feel the energy field of your inner body as you listen. That takes attention away from thinking and creates a still space that enables you to truly listen without the mind interfering. You are giving the other person space space to be. It is the most precious gift you can give. This is the beginning of the realization of oneness, which is Jove. At the deepest level of being, you are one with all that is. Most human relationships consist mainly of minds interacting with each other, not of human beings communicating being in communion. No relationship can thrive in that way, and that is why there is so much conflict in relationships. When the mind is running your life, conflict, strife, and problems are inevitable. Being in touch with your inner body creates a clear space of no mind, within which the relationship can flower. Portals into the unmanifested. Going deeply into the body, I can feel the energy inside my body, especially in my arms and legs. And I don't seem to be able to go more deeply, as you suggested earlier. Make it into a meditation. It needn't take long. 10 to 15 minutes of clock time should be sufficient. Make sure first that there are no external distractions such as telephones or people who are likely to interrupt you. Sit on a chair, but don't lean back. Keep the spine erect. Doing so will help you to stay alert. Alternatively, choose your own favorite position for meditation. 
Make sure the body is relaxed. Close your eyes. Take a few deep breaths. Feel yourself breathing into the lower abdomen, as it were. Observe how it expands and contracts slightly with each in and out breath. Then become aware of the entire inner energy field of the body. Don't think about it, feel it. By doing this, you reclaim consciousness from the mind. If you find it helpful, use the light visualization I described earlier. When you can feel the inner body clearly as a single field of energy, let go, if possible, of any visual image and focus exclusively on the feeling. If you can, also drop any mental image you may still have of the physical body. All that is left then is an all-encompassing sense of presence or beingness, and the inner body is felt to be without a boundary. Then take your attention even more deeply into that feeling. Become one with it. Merge with the energy field so that there is no longer a perceived duality of the observer and the observed, of you and your body. The distinction between inner and outer also dissolves now, so there is no inner body anymore. By going deeply into the body, you have transcended the body. Having access to that formless realm is truly liberating. It frees you from bondage to form and identification with form. It is life in its undifferentiated state prior to its fragmentation into multiplicity. We may call it the unmanifested, the invisible source of all things, the being within all beings. It is a realm of deep stillness and peace, but also of joy and intense aliveness. Whenever you are present, you become transparent to some extent to the light, the pure consciousness that emanates from the source. You also realize that the light is not separate from who you are, but constitutes your very essence. The source of Kai is the unmanifested what in the East is called Kai, a kind of universal life energy. No, it isn't. The unmanifested is the source of Kai. Kai is the inner energy field of your body. It is the bridge between the outer you and the source. It lies halfway between the manifested, the world of form, and the unmanifested. Kai can be likened to a river or an energy stream. If you take the focus of your consciousness deeply into the inner body, you are tracing the course of this river back to its source. Kai is movement. The unmanifested is stillness. When you reach a point of absolute stillness, which is nevertheless vibrant with life, you have gone beyond the inner body and beyond Kai to the source itself, the unmanifested. Kai is the link between the unmanifested and the physical universe. So if you take your attention deeply into the inner body, you may reach this point, the singularity, where the world dissolves into the unmanifested, and the unmanifested takes on form as the energy stream of Kai, which then becomes the world. This is the point of birth and death. When your consciousness is directed outward, mind and world arise. When it is directed inward, it realizes its own source and returns home into the unmanifested. Then, when your consciousness comes back to the manifested world, you reassume the form identity that you temporarily relinquished. You have a name, a past, a life situation, a future. Now let your spiritual practice be this. As you go about your life, don't give 100% of your attention to the external world and to your mind. Keep some within. I have spoken about this already. Feel the inner body even when engaged in everyday activities, especially when engaged in relationships or when you are relating with nature. Feel the stillness deep inside it. Keep the portal open. Dreamless sleep. You take a journey into the unmanifested every night when you enter the phase of deep dreamless sleep. You merge with the source. You draw from it the vital energy that sustains you for a while when you return to the manifested the world of separate forms. This energy is much more vital than food. Man does not live by bread alone, but in dreamless sleep, you don't go into it consciously. Although the bodily functions are still operating, you no longer exist in that state. Can you imagine what it would be like to go into dreamless sleep with full consciousness? It is impossible to imagine it, because that state has no content. The unmanifested does not liberate you until you enter it consciously. That's why Jesus did not say, the truth will make you free, but rather, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. This is not a conceptual truth. It is the truth of eternal life beyond form, which is known directly or not at all. But don't attempt to stay conscious in dreamless sleep. It is highly unlikely that you will succeed. At most, you may remain conscious during the dream phase, but not beyond that. This is called lucid dreaming, which may be interesting and fascinating, 
and it is not liberating. So use your inner body as a portal through which you enter the unmanifested, and keep that portal open, so that you stay connected with the source at all times. It makes no difference, as far as the inner body is concerned. Whether your outer physical body is old or young, frail or strong, the inner body is timeless. If you are not yet able to feel the inner body, use one of the other portals, although ultimately they are all one. Some I have spoken about at length already, but I'll mention them again briefly here. Other portals. The now can be seen as the main portal. It is an essential aspect of every other portal, including the inner body. You cannot be in your body without being intensely present in the now. Time and the manifested are as inextricably linked as are the timeless now and the unmanifested. When you dissolve psychological time through intense present moment awareness, you become conscious of the unmanifested both directly and indirectly. Directly, you feel it as the radiance and power of your conscious presence. No content, just presence. Indirectly, you are aware of the unmanifested in and through the sensory realm. In other words, you feel the God essence in every creature, every flower, every stone, and you realize, all that is, is holy. This is why Jesus, speaking entirely from his essence or Christ identity, says in the Gospel of Thomas, split a piece of wood, I am there, lift up a stone, and you will find me there. Another portal into the unmanifested is created through the cessation of thinking. This can start with a very simple thing, such as taking one conscious breath or looking, in a state of intense alertness, at a flower, so that there is no mental commentary running at the same time. There are many ways to create a gap in the incessant stream of thought. This is what meditation is all about. Thought is part of the realm of the manifested. Continuous mind activity keeps you imprisoned in the world of form and becomes an opaque screen that prevents you from becoming conscious of the unmanifested, conscious of the formless and timeless God essence in yourself and in all things and all creatures. When you are intensely present, you don't need to be concerned about the cessation of thinking, of course because the mind then stops automatically. That's why I said the now is an essential aspect of every other portal. Surrender the letting go of mental emotional resistance to what is also becomes a portal into the unmanifested. The reason for this is simple. Inner resistance cuts you off from other people, from yourself, from the world around you. It strengthens the feeling of separateness on which the ego depends for its survival. The stronger the feeling of separateness, the more you are bound to the manifested, to the world of separate forms. The more you are bound to the world of form, the harder and more impenetrable your form identity becomes. The portal is closed, and you are cut off from the inner dimension, the dimension of depth. It's up to you to open a portal in your life that gives you conscious access to the unmanifested. Get in touch with the energy field of the inner body. Be intensely present. Disidentify from the mind. Surrender to what is. These are all portals you can use, but you only need to use one. Surely love must also be one of those portals. No, it isn't. As soon as one of the portals is open, love is present in you as the feeling realization of oneness. Love isn't a portal. It's what comes through the portal into this world. As long as you are completely trapped in your form identity, there can be no love. Your task is not to search for love but to find a portal through which love can enter. Are there any other portals apart from those you just mentioned? Yes, there are. The unmanifested is not separate from the manifested. It pervades this world, but it is so well disguised that almost everybody misses it completely. If you know where to look, you'll find it everywhere. A portal opens up every moment. Do you hear that dog barking in the distance? Or that car passing by? Listen carefully. Can you feel the presence of the unmanifested in that? You can't. Look for it in the silence out of which the sounds come and into which they return. Pay more attention to the silence than to the sounds. Paying attention to outer silence creates inner silence. The mind becomes still. A portal is opening up. Every sound is born out of silence dies back into silence, and during its lifespan is surrounded by silence. Silence enables the sound to be. It is an intrinsic but unmanifested part of every sound, every musical note, every song, every word. The unmanifested is present in this world as silence. This is why it has been said that nothing in this world is so like God as silence. All you have to do is pay attention to it. Even during a conversation, 
become conscious of the gaps between words, the brief silent intervals between sentences. As you do that, the dimension of stillness grows within you. You cannot pay attention to silence without simultaneously becoming still within. Silence without, stillness within. You have entered the unmanifested. Just as no sound can exist without silence, nothing can exist without no thing. Without the empty space that enables it to be, every physical object or body has come out of nothing, is surrounded by nothing, and will eventually return to nothing. Not only that, but even inside every physical body there is far more nothing than something. Buddhists have known that for over Z5 U years, form is emptiness, emptiness is form states the Heart Sutra, one of the best-known ancient Buddhist texts. The essence of all things is emptiness. The unmanifested is not only present in this world as silence, it also pervades the entire physical universe, a space from within and without. This is just as easy to miss as silence. Everybody pays attention to the things in space, but who pays attention to space itself? You seem to be implying that emptiness or nothing is not just nothing that there is some mysterious quality to it. What is this nothing? You cannot ask such a question. Your mind is trying to make nothing into something. The moment you make it into something, you have missed it. Nothing space is the appearance of the unmanifested as an externalized phenomenon in a sense-perceived world. That's about as much as one can say about it. And even that is a kind of paradox. It cannot become an object of knowledge. You can't do a PhD on nothing. When scientists study space, they usually make it into something and thereby miss its essence entirely. Not surprisingly, the latest theory is that space isn't empty at all, that it is filled with some substance. Once you have a theory, it's not too hard to find evidence to substantiate it, at least until some other theory comes along. Nothing can only become a portal into the unmanifested for you, if you don't try to grasp or understand it. Isn't that what we are doing here? Not at all. I am giving you pointers to show you how you can bring the dimension of the unmanifested into your life. We are not trying to understand it. There is nothing to understand. Space has no existence. To exist literally means to stand out. You cannot understand space because it doesn't stand out. Although in itself it has no existence, it enables everything else to exist. Silence has no existence either, nor does the unmanifested. There would be no room without it. Since space is nothing, we can say that what is not there is more important than what is there. So become aware of the space that is all around you. Don't think about it. Feel it, as it were. Pay attention to nothing. As you do that, a shift in consciousness takes place inside you. Here is why. The inner equivalent to objects in space such as furniture, walls, and so on are your mind objects, thoughts, emotions, and the objects of the senses. And the inner equivalent of space is the consciousness that enables your mind objects to be, just as space allows all things to be. So if you withdraw attention from things objects in space you automatically withdraw attention from your mind objects as well. In other words, you cannot think and be aware of space or of silence, for that matter. By becoming aware of the empty space around you, you simultaneously become aware of the space of no mind, of pure consciousness, the unmanifested. This is how the contemplation of space can become a portal for you. Space and silence are two aspects of the same thing, the same nothing. They are an externalization of inner space and inner silence, which is stillness, the infinitely creative womb of all existence. Most humans are completely unconscious of this dimension. There is no inner space, no stillness. They are out of balance. In other words, they know the world, or think they do but they don't know God. They identify exclusively with their own physical and psychological form, unconscious of essence. And because every form is highly unstable, they live in fear. This fear causes a deep misperception of themselves and of other humans, a distortion in their vision of the world. If some cosmic convulsion brought about the end of our world, the unmanifested would remain totally unaffected by this. A Course in Miracles expresses this truth poignantly. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. If you remain in conscious connection with the unmanifested, you value, love, and deeply respect the manifested and every life form in it, 
as an expression of the one life beyond form. You also know that every form is destined to dissolve again, and that ultimately nothing out here matters all that much. You have overcome the world, in the words of Jesus, or, as the Buddha put it, you have crossed over to the other shore. The true nature of space and time. Now consider this. If there were nothing but silence, it wouldn't exist for you. You wouldn't know what it is. Only when sound appears does silence come into being. Similarly, if there were only space without any objects in space, it wouldn't exist for you. Imagine yourself as a point of consciousness floating in the vastness of space no stars, no galaxies, just emptiness. Suddenly, space wouldn't be vast anymore. It would not be there at all. There would be no speed, no movement from here to there. At least two points of reference are needed for distance and space to come into being. Space comes into being the moment the one becomes two, and as two become the ten thousand things, as Lao Tzu calls the manifested world, space becomes more and more vast. So world and space arise simultaneously. Nothing could be without space, yet space is nothing. Before the universe came into being, before the Big Bang if you like, there wasn't a vast empty space waiting to be filled. There was no space, as there was no thing. There was only the unmanifested the one. When the one became the ten thousand things, suddenly space seemed to be there and enabled the many to be. Where did it come from? Go out on a clear night and look up at the sky. The thousands of stars you can see with the naked eye are no more than an infinitesimal fraction of what is there. One thousand million galaxies can already be detected with the most powerful telescopes. Each galaxy and island universe, containing thousands of millions of stars. Yet, what is even more awe-inspiring is the infinity of space itself. The depth and stillness that allows all of that magnificence to be. Nothing could be more awe-inspiring and majestic than the inconceivable vastness and stillness of space. And yet what is it? Emptiness, vast emptiness. What appears to us as space in our universe perceived through the mind and the senses is the unmanifested itself, externalized. It is the body of God. And the greatest miracle is this. That stillness and vastness that enables the universe to be is not just out there in space, it is also within you. When you are utterly and totally present, you encounter it as the still inner space of no mind. Within you, it is vast in depth not in extension. Spatial extension is ultimately a misperception of infinite depth and attribute of the one transcendental reality. According to Einstein, space and time are not separate. I don't really understand it. But I think he is saying that time is the fourth dimension of space. He calls it the space-time continuum. Yes, what you perceive externally as space and time are ultimately illusory but they contain a core of truth. They are the two essential attributes of God, infinity and eternity, perceived as if they had an external existence outside you. Within you, both space and time have an inner equivalent that reveals their true nature, as well as your own. The world, too, continues to exist for you, but it will not bind you anymore. Hence, the ultimate purpose of the world lies not within the world but in transcendence of the world. Just as you would not be conscious of space if there were no objects in space, the world is needed for the unmanifested to be realized. You may have heard the Buddhist saying, if there were no illusion, there would be no enlightenment. Conscious death, apart from dreamless sleep, which I mentioned already, there is one other involuntary portal. It opens up briefly at the time of physical death. Even if you have missed all the other opportunities for spiritual realization during your lifetime, one last portal will open up for you immediately after the body has died. There are countless accounts by people who had a visual impression of this portal as radiant light, and then returned from what is commonly known as a near-death experience. Many of them also spoke of a sense of blissful serenity and deep peace. In the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it is described as the luminous splendor of the colorless light of emptiness, which it says is your own true self. Most of what happens after that is involuntary and automatic. Eventually, there will be another round of birth and death. Their presence wasn't strong enough yet for conscious immortality. So going through this portal does not mean annihilation. Approaching death and death itself, the dissolution of the physical form, 
is always a great opportunity for spiritual realization. This opportunity is tragically missed most of the time, since we live in a culture that is almost totally ignorant of death, as it is almost totally ignorant of anything that truly matters. Every portal is a portal of death, the death of the false self. When you go through it, you cease to derive your identity from your psychological, mind-made form. You then realize that death is an illusion, just as your identification with form was an illusion. The end of illusion that's all that death is. It is painful only as long as you cling to illusion. Chapter 8 Enlightened Relationships Enter the now from wherever you are. I always thought that true enlightenment is not possible except through love in a relationship between a man and a woman. Isn't this what makes us whole again? How can one's life be fulfilled until that happens? Is that true in your experience? Has this happened to you? Not yet, but how could it be otherwise? I know that it will happen. In other words, you are waiting for an event in time to save you. Is this not the core error that we have been talking about? Salvation is not elsewhere in place or time. It is here and now. What does that statement mean? Salvation is here and now. I don't understand it. I don't even know what salvation means. Most people pursue physical pleasures or various forms of psychological gratification because they believe that those things will make them happy or free them from a feeling of fear or lack. Happiness may be perceived as a heightened sense of aliveness attained through physical pleasure or a more secure and more complete sense of self attained through some form of psychological gratification. This is the search for salvation from a state of unsatisfactoriness or insufficiency. Invariably, any satisfaction that they obtain is short-lived, so the condition of satisfaction or fulfillment is usually projected once again onto an imaginary point away from the here and now. When I obtain this or am free of that then I will be okay. This is the unconscious mindset that creates the illusion of salvation in the future. True salvation is fulfillment, peace, life in all its fullness. It is to be who you are, to feel within you the good that has no opposite. The joy of being that depends on nothing outside itself. It is felt not as a passing experience, but is an abiding presence. In theistic language, it is to know God not as something outside you, but as your own innermost essence. True salvation is to know yourself as an inseparable part of the timeless and formless one life.